aftermath of the Brexit vote in 2016 has caused profound uncertainty for all people living in the UK. Discrimination against European citizens has become more and more challenging following the vote. Uh, we've come to London to meet those affected and those who are fighting to protect the key right to freedom of movement. How do you think it will affect the lives of British citizens? Um, in a pretty poor way, to be fair. I think we're probably going to lose quite a bit of money um, at first, but you know the foundations are there to sort of bring us into a market, but I just don't believe our government at the moment, at the present time, has the sort of ability to carry us there. Mm. So in a way, whilst I personally didn't vote for it myself, I do believe that um, there is money to be made say five ten years down the future but will the government be able to provide that for us i don't know mm -hmm. and how do you think it will affect the lives of immigrants from the eu countries living right now in the uk um i have no idea to be fair i have no idea i don't really know what they're planning to do um it doesn't really look good i'll, I'll be honest but um you know it would be one of two situations where they will do what they sort of promised and try and kick them out um, or the more likely situation, nothing will change. And I think that is probably what it's going to be. How the Brexit will affect the life of uh, immigrants from the EU countries living in the UK? Mm. Well, I mean, from my point of view, I mean, I'm a, I'm, I'm a lecturer in architecture. And I'm uh, quite, I mean, I'm, I'm really afraid for the future because it is, I mean, it's so, so clear that we have less and less like, students now that are going to come over, uh, which will not get the same kind of uh, abilities to to learn from the place as how it was and so what that means is that i, I really i mean like it, it's going to get isolated or england will get isolated more than ever before which is not in anyone's advantage i believe so that's uh, kind of what i fear for how do you think brexit will affect the lives of british citizens uh, so i'm i'm belgian uh, mm. i think it will massively impact uh, trade and economic relations between countries massively. We've already seen lots of banks and large corporate companies moving their headquarters to outside of the United Kingdom, so it's, it's bound to have an impact on the economy and especially on farmers, I think. Um, and I, I think much of the British population did not think of that when they voted to leave the EU. I don't want to stay in the country. I don't want to be staying in a country that feels that it's not good. It's too good to Europe or something like that. Like, I don't believe in the barriers and I think Brexit will have barriers. How do you think Brexit will affect the lives of EU immigrants living in the UK? Hugely, I think that's one of the main reasons it happened and why people voted exit in the first place. I think it would be a real shame. London specifically, like, what we love about it is how multicultural it is. The food, the people, it's what makes the city. So. Stopping that in any format will be disastrous, really. Mm -hmm. For decades, thousands of people from all over the globe have made themselves at home here in this cosmopolitan city. London seems to be prosperous and affluent, but for many people, and migrants in particular, the city and the country are not the paradise they expected. The biggest migrant group affected by what's going on are Poles. Majority of them moved to the UK after Poland joined the EU in 2004. Today I'm meeting with Zosia Brom, a Polish gardener who has been living in the UK for almost 15 years. Spotykam się u ciebie Zosia w mieszkaniu w Londynie. Jesteś tutaj od już od jakiegoś czasu, prawda? W, w Anglii mieszkasz, mieszkasz poza Polską od 20 lat. W Anglii mieszkam od 2004 roku, właściwie od czasu, kiedy, kiedy można było tutaj przyjechać bez, bez ogarniania żadnych, żadnych papierów. Mhm. Czyli z tego co pamiętam, przyjechałam w, w lipcu 2004 roku. 
Mhm. I pamiętasz atmosferę, jaka wtedy była? Czy byłaś tutaj, czułaś się mile widziana? Tak i nie. Znaczy w sensie, jeżeli chodzi o jakieś kontakty, kontakty z ludźmi, to tak jak najbardziej. Ale było bardzo dużo wiadomości w mediach przeciwko Polakom i generalnie Eastern Europeans, to się, to się nazywało, jeżeli nie chciało się być rasistowskim. Tak więc generalnie była, była panika medialna związana z tym, że cała Polska tutaj, tutaj przyjedzie, ale nie było, tego, nie, nie było to widoczne w żaden sposób na, na, na ulicy. Nigdy nie, nie doświadczyłam, właściwie do 2016 roku nie doświadczyłam żadnego, żadnego incydentu z tym związanego. Wszyscy raczej byli ciekawi, bardzo często mylili Polskę z Holandią, jak mówiłam skąd jestem, ale to był tak naprawdę największy problem jaki, jaki miałam wtedy. Mówisz, że 2004 rok to był, to był przyjazd, a później w 2016 dopiero były sytuacje, które... W 2016 roku, tuż przed i tuż po, po referendum, zdarzyło mi się kilka razy, że na przykład ktoś zwrócił mi uwagę za, za rozmawianie po polsku przez, przez telefon. I, zda, I zaczęły się też pytania, co ty tutaj robisz, czy jest się tutaj legalnie. Policja też inaczej się zaczęła odnosić do, do ludzi, nagle zaczęli sprawdzać dokumenty i, i chcieli dzwonić do home office i, i tego typu rzeczy. Wcześniej absolutnie te, tego nie robili. Więc no generalnie zmieni, zmieniło się to, znaczy zmieniło się tak jak Ci mówiłam, że zmieniło się to wraz z popularnością partii UKIP, mhm. moim zdaniem. Aczkolwiek chciałabym zwrócić uwagę na jedną rzecz, że ja jestem białą kobietą i nie chciałabym tego porównywać w żaden sposób do, do doświadczeń innych ludzi, dlatego że zdaję sobie sprawę z tego, że dopóki nie, od, nie, nie otworzę ust, to nikt nawet nie wie, że ja nie jestem, nie jestem z Anglii i, 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 że, i rasizm jest w Anglii podobnie jak wszędzie indziej y, y, od zawsze. Także to jakby przeciwko Europejczykom i Eastern Europeans głównie. Y, się zaczęło niedawno, ale to nie znaczy, że, że moja sytuacja jest w jakikolwiek sposób porównywalna do, do innych grup ludzi, którzy tutaj mieszkają. Mhm. A miałaś wrażenie, że to jest taka decyzja, która wpływa bezpośrednio też na Twoje życie osobiście? E, tak, dlatego że e, no, jakkolwiek by się to nie skończyło, to na pewno stracę jakieś prawa. Jeszcze nie wiadomo, e, nie wiadomo jakie. Prawdopodobnie nie będę mogła głosować w, w lokalnych wyborach, ale jeszcze nic nie wiadomo tak na dobrą sprawę. Będę musiała e, e, zajmować się robotą papierkową, która ponoć ma być bardzo łatwa, ale szczerze to nie wiem i nie ufam zupełnie home, home office w, w tych sprawach. E, tak więc tak, na pewno ma to wpływ na, mo na moje życie. Mm -hmm. e, przez to, że mieszkasz e, od 2004 roku w Anglii, e, masz prawo ubiegać się o obywatelstwo. Czy rozważałaś e, taki ruch? E, e, mam prawo i rozważałam taki ruch, e, ale e, po pierwsze je, e, nie wiem, czy chcę tutaj zostać. Wydaje mi się też, że jest to trochę nie fair, bo tak, ja mogę sobie załatwić obywatelstwo, prawdopodobnie, ale tak naprawdę bardzo wiele osób, które tutaj mieszkają dłużej ode mnie albo, albo tyle co ja, nie mogą tego zrobić, dlatego że nie są, z, nie są z Europy i dlatego nie wiem, jakoś wydaje mi się, że głupio by mi było, szczerze mówiąc. Możliwe, że to, zro, że to zrobię, Jesz, jeszcze, jeszcze, jeszcze nie wiem tak naprawdę. Wiem, że jest to koszmarny proces, e, który bardzo dużo kosztuje i, i niekoniecznie kończy się e, sukcesem. Mhm. Że... Czyli obawiasz się realnie, że Brexit jest w stanie ograniczyć prawo do wolnego przemieszczania się w Europie? E, myślę, że tak. E, prawdopodobnie nie dla mnie, bo tutaj jednak jestem już e, jestem długo, ale myślę, że tak, po jakikolwiek będzie ten okres prze, e, przejściowy, e, na pewno og e, zostaną ograniczone prawa do swobodnego przemieszczania się tutaj. Mhm. A czy z perspektywy czasu tych e, prawie że dwóch lat od, od, e, od decyzji e, widzisz może jakieś pozytywy e, takiego wyniku referendum i wyniku głosowania? E, czy widzę pozytywy? E, one są wszystkie bardzo złośliwe. Mhm. E, myślę, że e, 
bardzo możliwe, że, że Wielka Brytania jako, jak, jako kraj, chociaż jest dobra Anglia, bo nie, nie chcę być niesprawiedliwa, jeżeli chodzi o Szkocję, e, że bardzo możliwe, że przyda im się lekcja e, nie bycia uprzywilejowanym krajem. Mhm. E, ale jest to naprawdę poważna gimnastyka umysłowa, żeby, 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 żeby zrobić z Brexitu jakikolwiek pozytyw. Ale... A jeśli jednak nie obywatelstwo brytyjskie i zdecydujesz się wyjechać z Londynu, to podzielisz się z nami, jakie, jakie inne miejsca rozważałaś? Dla... No, zastanawiam się nad, nad przeprowadzką do Hiszpanii, do, do Barcelony w tym momencie. Mhm. E... Z, z wielu względów e, no Brexit był raczej wisienką na torcie, jeżeli chodzi o, e, o podejmowanie tej decyzji niż, mhm. e, niż bezpośrednią e, e, przyczyną. E, ale tak, zastanawiam się podobnie jak większość moich znajomych, e, którzy nie mają e, brytyjskiego paszportu, żeby stąd wyjechać po prostu. Mhm. Niekoniecznie dlatego, że, że obawiam się o, e, o jakąś swoją, e, swoją sytuację, ale dlatego, że no, połowa społeczeństwa zdecydowała, że, że, że jesteśmy tutaj niemile widziani, więc... E, Sorry, ale radźcie sobie sami. <laughs> Zosia's testimony made me realize that even when you are a skilled worker with a regular income, UK can still be a challenging place to live in after Brexit. Foreign workers are those who often find themselves at the bottom of the labor market, forced to work long hours for low pay without adequate protections. Work remain the most common reason people come to live in Britain. More than 275,000 came to work in the UK in 2016, and the majority of them, 180,000, had their jobs arranged before they arrived. Today, I'm at the Unison office, one of the UK's largest trade unions. I'm here to meet Marina Printulis, an activist and a member of Another Europe is Possible, to talk about the challenges that the EU citizens living in the UK are facing after Brexit and how they are organizing to protect their rights. Can you please tell me how the rights of freedom of movement of EU citizens living in the UK were impacted since the Brexit vote? Yeah, it's a very difficult situation and we are living into a nightmare, I mean, EU citizens as well. So, you know that uh, how we apply in order to get permanent residency has changed. Before it wasn't necessary, now it is necessary. So, a lot of people, they rush to apply for permanent residency because they've been here, they have their families, their homes, they cannot live into this situation where they don't know what is going to happen. And a lot of these applications for permanent residency all or what it follows from that, which is citizenship, they were rejected. And they were rejected on grounds that they are not convincing and on grounds that they couldn't have done anything um, about it. So, for example, they figured out, as they did the application and it was rejected, that in periods, although they were, uh, there is a national health system in Britain, when they were out of work or in particular self-employed jobs, they should have a private insurance, health insurance, which nobody knew about that. And a lot of applications were rejected on these grounds. So now imagine these people like me that we've been here all our lives and this is our home and some have families and jobs and their kids and they've been here for 20, 30, 40 years, suddenly to see their applications rejected. But it wasn't only that, is that after that they were receiving letters from the Home Office saying to them that you are going to be deported soon. This totally destroyed their world, it created a huge anxiety and I think a lot of uh, the EU nationals in Britain right now, they, they have to live with this anxiety and it's a terrible environment and a very unpleasant and hostile environment or that's how we feel about it. Mm -hmm. And what would you say to people that criticize freedom of movement as a force that uh, depress wages and like worse and the working conditions of like everyone in working in the country that... Yeah. Uh, there are quite a lot of these um, arguments. Usually they come from the right, or the extreme right, but unfortunately sometimes not only from there. But we have to remember this is not something new. 
There was a scandal lately in Britain about the migrants that they came after the Second World War, 48 in Britain from uh, the Caribbean, Jamaica and so on. And they were also, a lot of them rejected their status and they were deported. It was a huge scandal. But back then, after the Second World War, when we had the migration from the Caribbean, we had exactly the same arguments, that these are workers, that they are undercutting our wages, we have to get rid of them, and it was from the right, but not only from the right. This is what it makes it so devastated. So my answer to that will be that you cannot talk about employment rights and try to turn different groups of workers one against each other, which is the situation that we have now. What we have to do is defend migrant rights and try to extend migrant rights but all employment rights for all working people. This is what we are working about try to avoid these divisions and try to create a framework where all our employment rights, including the rights of migrants, they will be uh, protected. One way to do that is going sector by sector and have uh, uh, bargaining agreements that they will put a minimum in terms of the conditions but also in terms of payment. And you're part of like some of campaigns. Can you tell me about like the initiatives and campaigns that you are involved in? One is the one that I mentioned, which is uh, Labour for Freedom of Movement, because I'm a member of the Labour Party. Another one is Another Europe is Possible. It's campaigning for remaining within the EU, but it is also at the same time very critical of the EU. This is not the EU that we want, but we believe we should remain in order to, to change things and make the European Union what we all had in mind um, some time ago, which was a social and probably socialist European Union. Can you tell me um, what is your work here in the community centre? Uh, this is Greenwich Migrant Hub and it's a completely voluntary service that's provided for people, vulnerable migrants they described, anybody who's got difficulty with not just their immigration situation but because insecure immigration status has got lots of knock-on effects for things like entitlement to housing, um, uh, children in local schools, I mean, all sorts of welfare considerations get rolled into it. And it's a weekly advice session, and we have it usually in the region of, of anything to 30, sometimes more than that, people coming in. And we do our best to unravel their problems and see what assistance we can give them. I saw you were uh, doing council today, and what are like the typical problems that people bring to you? Um, the typical problem is just total incomprehension a lot of the time. Um, immigration status in the UK is immensely complicated. Um, the immigration rules consist of whole volumes of books that are constantly changing. There's, since 2010 there's been something like 30,000 changes to the immigration regulations. Um, so, you know, if you've been here for two or three years, it's quite likely that the rules that govern your immigration status are constantly changing. Um, and people don't properly understand that. Um, and it has implications not just simply for their resident status, but also their right to work. Um, if, a, if an employer feels that you've moved into a situation where your right to be in the country is now being questioned, then it becomes illegal for the employer to continue their employee, employment. And if employers get it wrong, they will that they are fined um, for having made that mistake. So, and similarly, it's similarly the case with landlords as well. Private sector landlords, they're required to be assured that a person is legally resident in the country, um, and so they're continually putting pressure on their tenants to give an account of where they stand in relation to the Home Office. So there's a, a huge amount of insecurity and, and turmoil. Um, people are going along for services, 
like the classic one is GP services or to a local hospital, to a clinic, and they find that they're being asked to pay bills for health treatment that they thought they were entitled to for free. So, you know, these are the range of problems that we're having to deal with. Mm -hmm. Are there any specific problems that migrants that are EU citizens face? Um, at the moment, it is um, lack of knowledge about their long-term situation. They've moved in a very short space of time um, from having a, a pretty comprehensive set of rights. Um, the right to come into the country, the right to find work, uh, the right to be treated on more or less equal terms as British citizens in things like social security, housing, welfare benefits, healthcare treatment. Um, you know, they, they, they had a more or less cast iron assurance that they would get equal treatment in this area. That is all up in the air now um, and nobody really knows. We moved from a situation in which at one point the, uh, the, the government was quite deliberately using the insecurity of European community nationals in a bog as a bargaining ship um, in the process of the, the Brexit negotiations. Um, and people really felt that. There was something in a region of three million EU nationals who were living here. Um, and they want to do things. They wanted to know whether they um, could, should they buy a house, for example, should they negotiate a mortgage. Should they negotiate a large bank loan? Um, because they, they don't know um, where they're going to be in a year's time or in, in two years' time. Um, you know, the, the confidence that they once had that they could enrol their children in a local school and their, their children would have five, ten, they would complete their whole system of schooling in the UK. That is no longer there at the moment and everybody is waiting to see the outcome of Brexit. And then uh, some uh, group, groups, it's, it's bad enough for people who've got regular jobs and so on, um, but for EU nationals who are working in uh, insecure sectors of employment, they're rely, reliant on employment agencies, they're doing short-time work, zero-hour contracts, all of these things which are very, very common in the UK labour market at the moment. Um, if you are an EU national in that category, then any question that is raised as to whether you are genuinely pursuing a right to remain on the basis of employment is, is their right in front of you. And people, I mean, they go along to job centres to uh, inquire about job vacancies and they're being told they're no longer le legally entitled to be in the country. Um, and, you know, they, they have a prospect of certainly being asked to leave the country and possibly even being deported if they, they do that. All of these things are, are there happening to people now. We've seen how subtle forms of discrimination against the EU migrants living in the UK can be. At the same time, we've seen how strong the network of supports are in protecting individuals. With Brexit on the horizon, nobody knows what will happen to the EU workers in the UK. But whatever changes around the corner, the networks and organizations that protect free movement within the EU are not going away anytime soon.